we are going to study fellowship in our systematic theology tonight. Um, you can actually turn to Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42, as we, as we get ready for this. But as I was looking at this topic, I thought, oh, fellowship, oh, awesome, how easy, right? How easy is this study to put together? So I started putting together my thoughts and my notes, and then I started gathering Bible verses and started putting that together, and I quickly, very quickly, very, very quickly became very overwhelmed with the extremity of um, the content that you can find regarding fellowship and what it is. So um, fellowship is one of those topics that, in all reality, basically touches on just about every other topic that um, we've gone through in this series. In one way or another, that's the reason for fellowship. That's the thing that we're fellowshipping around. And there's all sorts of things that have to do with fellowship. So tonight, we are barely going to scratch the surface. But I think it will give all of us and, and everybody who listens online, uh, a great launching pad, if you will, for to dive into fellowship further. Um, trying to keep it down to the short amount of time tonight. Otherwise, we would do a two-year-long study on fellowship and still not finish it. But Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42... <laughs> themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Verse 46, Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day, those who were being saved. Lord, we pray that you would continue to add to your number, your number, those that are being saved. But we pray that you would bless your word here tonight as we look at this topic. Amen. Well, fellowship. When we first start looking at fellowship, we have to ask the question, what is fellowship? Um... If there was ever a Greek word in the modern Christian realm, I would say, um, that all Christians went, oh, I know a little bit, I know a Greek word. Koinonia is probably one of those words. It's one of those easy to remember words. It's one of those that just, you know, oh yeah, it's used all the time. Koinonia. And koinonia means fellowship. It means to have something in common with another person. Two people having this, this commonality, if you will. From the, from the root word, um, koinonia builds, right? The root, root word is koino, koinonos, and I'm not going to get a big Greek lesson, but it's very important because we're building on this, is koinonos is a partner. It, it is it is 
a partner, one partner with another partner, someone who is coming alongside and partnering with you, when you add them together, you have two partners or multiple partners that have things in common. It's, it's a, the, the meaning of the word is a sense of community. It is, and we'll get into this um, a little bit later, joint participation. And that is the really big thing that when you look at it, koinonia or fellowship is everybody joint participation, jointly taking part in the things. Um, the Lexham Theological Workbook, and we put this in there to just kind of sound smart a little bit, right? Actually, it's a very, it's a really good tool. It says this about koinonia. Those who choose to willingly engage in mutual responsibility are described as having partnership or koinonia with the body of Christ, the gospel, the spirit, the sufferings of the Messiah, those things that we are joining in commonality with, we have those things in common, that is fellowship. Fellowship. Now, the New Testament, okay, to add on this a little bit, the New Testament was written in what's called Koine Greek. Koine Greek was the common language, the common Greek language at the time. It's because everybody whether they wanted to or not was forced to speak this language so that we have no communication problems we have no everybody has this in common um prior to christ's death and resurrection koinonia or the even really a word for fellowship it it, it almost didn't exist it, it, the concept was actually very different when you look at it in the Old Testament. The NA, there's only one time that is translated fellowship, which is our study tonight, right? In the Old Testament. And in reality, it probably shouldn't be translated in the Old Testament that way. Psalm 55, 14 says, We who had sweet fellowship together... Walked in the house of God in the throng. So, the NASB, which is really one of my top favorites, is the only Bible version that translates it fellowship. Um, the ESV, even the newer LSB, um, translate that word as counsel. Counsel. Even the King James Version or New King Jer Version um translate it as counsel in one way or another so really fellowship this kind of fellowship that we're talking about isn't it's almost a a new testament idea it's a this side of the cross type of idea because prior to the cross just like lexham's theological workbook says we don't have the body of christ or the gospel in common prior to his death and resurrection. We don't have the, the Holy Spirit the way that we do now prior to his death and resurrection. We don't have the sufferings of the Messiah prior to that. So fellowship, this type of fellowship is a New Testament concept, a New Testament idea, and I love that. So looking at this verse, when you go through the rest of the, the New Testament, whenever koinonia or fellowship is mentioned, it denotes some kind of sharing. That's that mutual participation that I was talking about. It's, it's a sharing with someone like an offering or a gift or even sharing in somebody's experience, right? They experienced this and I've come alongside them and now I can share in their experience. That's why the Bible says that, that those that are, we weep with those that are weeping. We rejoice with those that are rejoicing. That is us having true fellowship with each other. But fellowship is more than just 
assembling. And I want to make that very clear because a lot of times people will teach from the pulpit very wrongly that you have to be at church to have fellowship. You have to be at the Bible study to have fellowship. You have to be, well, it's not just assembly for fellowship. People assemble all the time, but are they really truly having fellowship? If, if, if a bunch of Navy SEALs get together and they storm the gates of some secret bad person's lair, okay, and they're all together, they're all assembled, they're all of one heart, all of one mind, we're going to go in, we're going to shoot the bad guys, we're going to save the princess and get out, are they having fellowship? Right? Is it because it's based on just assembly? It's not. People come together with one heart, one mind, for political reasons. Just because they're assembling and they have the same concepts, that is not fellowship. The word and the concept of Christian koinonia or fellowship is the unity of the spirit that comes from a Christian's shared beliefs, convictions, and behaviors. So as I was putting this together, those are the, those are the overall features of true Christian koinonia. It's the unity of the spirit that comes from a Christian's shared beliefs, convictions, and behaviors. When those shared values are in place, genuine koinonia or biblical fellowship then occurs. So that fellowship produces mutual um, cooperation in the worship of God, right? Mutual cooperation in the worship of God. That fellowship produces cooperation in the sharing of responsibilities that God calls us to. So God calls us to all sorts of different responsibilities in our Christian rock. Fellowship <coughs> is one of those things that produces that cooperation. Fellowship produces the cooperation together as you try to adhere to God's will. His will being done in the world. So true fellowship must be with believers. It has to be with believers. If it's, if it's through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, non-believers don't have that Spirit within them. So non-believers, people who the Lord has not regenerated, who have not received the Holy Spirit as the seal of salvation who do not believe in Jesus Christ as their risen savior or people like that you cannot have true christian koinonia because they are not part of what god has knit together what god has knit together is entirely different than what the world has and what the world offers. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 7 says this, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. You cannot have that fellowship with somebody, true fellowship with somebody that doesn't partake, does not celebrate Christ as their savior. True Christian fellowship is something created by, made possible through, and because of God and God alone. It's not the punch and cookies after church, right? It's not just the potlucks. And I know there's a lot of great fellowship that happened at our potlucks. I love our potlucks, right? They're amazing. But it doesn't, fellowship doesn't just take place because you're gathered together at a potluck. It is 
preeminently a work of God through the Holy Spirit. That is true fellowship. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14 says, The grace of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You can see everything starts and is because and happens through God, through the Holy Spirit. So true Christ, Christian fellowship is a God thing. It's, be, it's a because of Jesus thing. I, I, that's really what it is. It's a because of Jesus thing. And even Jesus alludes to it in, John, um, in John's gospel, chapter 17, 22, when he says, um, God, that glory that you gave me, I gave it to them so that they can be one just like we are. That's what true fellowship is. The, the glory that Jesus receives, right? That wonderful thing from God that he gives to us. The world doesn't have that. We can't be one with another person that doesn't have that. Oh, we can be friends. Absolutely. We can have great friendships. We can have buddies and bros and and work relationships, but that kind of relationship has to be because of Christ. So, now understanding what fellowship is, let's look at the different types of fellowship. First off, we have because of, through, and by God. Our fellowship is first and foremost with God, right? Obviously, our fellowship must start if it's a God thing, if it's a because of Jesus thing. It has to start with God. 1 Corinthians 1, 9 says, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son. Huh. Into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Fellowship with God goes all the way back. The concept goes all the way back to Adam. Right? Adam walked with God. Adam talked with God. Adam sinned. And that type of fellowship was severed. Bottom line. Adam had the fellowship. He had that relationship. That, that, a perfect relationship with God. And then they sinned. So that type of fellowship was severed. So God, in all his grace, made other ways... For us to have fellowship with him. And we, as you go through, as you march through the Old Testament, you see some of those ways. It was through his presence. Now, his presence is different on this side of the cross than it was then. Back then, his presence was with Israel. Really, Israel. It was in the tabernacle. His presence was then later in the the temple after they grew or grew after they built the temple his presence was there then his presence was in jerusalem when jerusalem got rebuilt these this is all things that god says look at here's where my presence is here's where you can have fellowship but that was a different kind of fellowship right a different kind of fellowship with god than was previously with adam it was a distant fellowship there was still a veil that was in between and we can come kind of close but we can't come all the way we can get near but we can't pass over the that dividing line if you will because everything was on this side of the fall there was that sinful sever cut off everything stops right because of sin so God has to do something different. True relationship or fellowship with God was disrupted in the garden. But, here's the good thing, but it has been repaired through Jesus Christ. Now, that veil was torn, right? And the presence of God is accessible, right? Through Jesus, we have the only proper basis for our fellowship with God. And for true human fellowship with each other, it's only through Jesus. Jesus changed the way that we have fellowship with the Father, right? The Old Testament, you got close, but you couldn't go too far. 
You couldn't. That was it. Jesus changed all that. And I think it's a great thing. Ephesians 2, 18 and 19 says, Through him, we both have our access to the Father in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household through him. That's through Christ. That was through his sacrifice, through his death, through his resurrection. God restored the ability for us to have that relationship to him through his son, Jesus Christ. And he also made it inseparable from fellowship with each other. So once we're saved, once his spirit resides in us, we can have relationship with God like we couldn't before. We can have fellowship with God like we couldn't before. But the other flip side to that is, and you can't separate it, it's inseparable. Now we can have a different kind of relationship with each other. 1 John 1, 3 says, What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. See, our fellowship with God, now restored, now made different because of Christ, overflows and and changes our relationship as believers to each other. It's, it's this wonderful thing. So then we can move from there because God and our relationship, our fellowship with him, affects our relationship with each other. We can look at the next point, which is fellowship with each other. Based on our fellowship with God, all connected to our relationship with God. So our launching verse tonight said that the church continued every day in the apostles' teaching, right? The apostles' teaching. And boy, I would kind of wish there was a book that was exactly that, that they wrote through. But the closest thing that we can come to, uh, the earliest church manual, it's not canonized or anything like that, but the earliest church manual if you will, how to do this, how to do that, um, came out about 70 AD to 100 AD. It's um, it's referred to as um, the Didache, if you want, or Didache, if you want to pronounce it. But the Didache, Didache means teaching. That's all it means. It means teaching. And the traditional title for the Didache was the teachings of the Lord to the Gentiles by the 12 apostles. And there's a lot of scholars that will believe that this, the Didache, was truly the apostles teaching to new Gentile churches, right? They would take a copy of this and they would teach it to the new Gentile churches that had no idea of what to do now that they're saved. No idea how to interact with the world. No idea how to interact with each other. Right? So it was a sort of a a new disciplines, if you will. Disciplines, not you're naughty, I'm going to discipline you. But disciplines as these are the things that I should act, I should do, I should, I should, I should. Okay? Um, Even in the, even in the, the Didache, I'm going to, quote this this was pretty interesting moreover you shall seek out day by day the persons of the saints that you may find rest in their words this is coming from the the first early church manual and what is it talking about fellowship seek out day by day the persons the saints, other believers, seek them out so that you can find rest in their words, encouragement, right? Even when you look at the Apostles' Creed, right, which is a great summary of solid Christian doctrines. I love the Apostles' Creed. It says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. And there's a song. I almost want to sing it, but I'm not going to sing it for you guys. Creator of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. And then later on it says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Universal, not Roman Catholic, the Holy Catholic Church, and the communion of the saints. The communion of the saints. This is an awesome thing. When we look at that, the communion of the saints is not just something that we do on the last Sunday of the month. It's not something that's just bread and wine at communion. It refers to all believers in the past, all believers in the present, and all believers that are in the future sharing one common salvation. One common salvation. That's who we have fellowship with because we have that in common. If somebody is not a believer, I don't have that in common with them. So it can only go so far with my relationship. People who have passed into the presence of Christ have the same salvation as believers who are alive today. We believe that. Those who will come after us have the same hope that we do. We believe that. This, that is the communion of the saints. And fellowship, our fellowship with each other must be based on that Christian faith. We can have friendships and relationships with unbelievers, but true Christian fellowship can only occur in the body, within the body of Christ. And I, I love that. That's something special. That makes, that makes our fellowship something, wow. Wow, we have something that they don't. Completely different than they don't because we have the same salvation. We are united to one another, with one another, by, by faith, by purpose, by biblical goals, the things that God says for us to do. That's why it's only between believers. That's why it's only between saved and not the unsaved. Non-saved people don't have that God-established faith. They don't. Some people say, well, I, I have a faith. I have a faith. You have your faith. I have faith. Okay. It's not the same faith. And that same faith is the thing that we must have the commonality with to have fellowship. Our fellowship with believers is where God helps through each one of us encourage each other in our Christian walk. That's a big thing about fellowship, right? We don't want to take counsel from the world, but, but in the counsel of multitude or the multitude of, right? I'm totally messing that one up. There's, there's good counsel because we're all, we're all united by one thing and God's word. And so we can all help encourage each other, come alongside each other, spend time with each other, with all of those things. It is a God established relationship that only we have. I heard it said one time that fellowship is the means by which God allows Christians to persevere. And I really like that. Right? I mean, yes, God is with us. The Holy Spirit is in us and, and comes alongside us and rests on us. And there's all sorts of aspects of the Holy Spirit. But God uses people. And, and it is the means by which God allows Christians to persevere. Because if I'm down, if I'm struggling, if I'm anything, and my brother comes along next to me and encourages me because we're both of the faith and lifts me up, that's God using him in my life and vice versa. That is true fellowship. Fellowship is how God has intended for Christians to interact with each other so that we can encourage each other in the perseverance of our faith. I love that. Our men's ministry scripture, right? It's on the back of, back of our shirts. 
He comes from Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 20 through to 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And I... I'm going to stick, there's a lot in that verse, and I'm going to stick to just fellowship and not the forsaking the assembling part because we've kind of already discussed that in in brief at the beginning. Fellowship takes part more than just Sunday mornings, more than just Thursday nights, more than just the women's Bible study or the men's Bible study. Fellowship is that unity that we have with all that are saved, right? Fellowship, the the assembling together in a group, it's, well, it, it goes beyond that than just corporately in a building or it can go into a park or it can go into a lakeside. Wherever you are and you're getting into God's word is is where we can find fellowship with each other. I love that fellowship, looking at this, is so that we can stimulate one another to good works. That, that should be goals for each one of us. How, how can I encourage you and stimulate you to do good works? Not that works, again, not works is not what saves us or anything, but works are good things. Works are blessings to others. How can we stimulate each other those things? That's what fellowship is. Fellowship is so that we can encourage each other, lift each other up, exhort each other in our faith so that we can help guide and direct each other. Fellowship is so that we can rejoice when the other person is rejoicing, so that we can cry when the other person is crying. It is a God-given need in every Christian's life. That's the way he made us. He made us with a need, obviously a need for him, but a need for fellowship. Alistair Begg says, speaking of fellowship, there is to be a participation of feeling that my limitations and my weaknesses are complemented by your strengths. That's why you're here. That's why we're all here. That's what fellowship is. Is where I'm weak, you might be strong. And because of the fellowship that we have, that commonality that we have, you can lift me up. And then the day after tomorrow, when you're struggling, in something and that's a spot where I'm stronger in I should come alongside you and lift you up and encourage you I, I love that that's what fellowship is that's what we we really started this fellowship right this church on the basis of being able to come alongside each other to encourage each other to do life together and share in each other's weaknesses sharing each other's strengths, all of those things. When, uh, it's funny because we were kind of talking about growing kids the other day, but when we um, were raising our boys, we taught them, and this is where we got it, um, we taught them good, better, best. Good, better, best, right, as they were growing up. Doing good, well, that's, that's good. Right? Doing good. Well, I, you know, I thought about that person the other day. That's good. Maybe I prayed for him. That's good. Yeah, cool. We'll leave it at that. Okay. That's still good. I'm not trying to put it down. That's good. Right? But, you know, with just a, a little more effort, that good can turn into better. Good, better, best. A little bit more effort, that good can turn into better. And if you're really talking... Taking in the, the, the whole picture of this thing, 
you know that you can go even farther than that and do what's best. And that's what true fellowship is. True fellowship is, you know what? I really care about you. And I, I want to understand or know what you're going through. So I'm going to come alongside you. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to be there for you. It's good to know that people are praying for you, right? It's better to get the little emoji text. Okay. Oh, now I know. I really know that they're praying for me because they texted me the little emoji text. Or even I got a little phone call. You know, how I was thinking about you. Okay. But it's absolutely best to assemble together, whether it's one or whether it's two, three, or 25, right? To assemble together where we can encourage, we can uplift each other, we can cry with each other, rejoice with each other the way God intended his body to be. That is good, better, best. Our responsibility, or one responsibility of Christians out of Hebrews 10, oh, it's not still up there, that we just read was that to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. It's in that gathering together at at church. I'll, I'll say that. I, I, I won't deny that. It's, it's in that gathering together at church <laughs> or over lunch or one-on-one -on -one over coffee, right? That we do that stimulating, that we encourage one another. It's in that assembling together that we should be doing that encouraging. So speaking of encouraging, right? And bringing it full circle, talking about fellowship. Philippians, this kind of ties everything together. Philippians 2, 1 through 5 says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ. There's the big thing, in Christ. Because that is our commonality. That is our foundation. That is the reason. That is we the reason we have fellowship. That is who we have fellowship in and through. Okay? So if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. What is the chief end of man? We know that purpose. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others and have this attitude in yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus. That's fellowship. That really is a rounded out explanation of fellowship. Caring for each other, having that commonness of Jesus Christ, having that bond of salvation between us and the other person the bond that only jesus gives us fellowship is having that love for each other that christ has for us that's a big one man well, and fellowship is not perfect because we're not perfect but that's what it's about having the love of christ for each other fellowship is having the same purpose to glorify God in all that we do. It's the participation together in our strengths and in our weaknesses to give God glory, encourage each other, disciple each other, exhort each other, and correct <laughs> and correct each other. Fellowship is serving each other. That's why I love this verse to round out what fellowship is. We're living in difficult times, to say the least, when we look at the world. There's a lot of junk out there. And I, speaking personally, 
I need all of the good Christian fellowship that I can get because of all of those things, because of the encouragement, because of my weaknesses and your strengths, because of exhortation, because we all need to be corrected sometimes. I need all the brotherly help and instruction that is available. The world doesn't offer what the church offers. So we have to find it in the church. We have to find it among other believers. I like this. John Piper says this about fellowship. The mutual bond that Christians have with Christ uniting us to him which involves us in a profound deep eternal relationship of love with each other it overflows this mutual bond that we have together in him and it binds us together in a profound eternal relationship of love expressing itself in humble service to each other. I read that and went, wow, what a perfect, what a perfect explanation. The mutual bond that we have with Christ overflows into our relationship with other. And you will never find what you get here in this fellowship in fellowship period from the world you'll never find that so without trying to sound legalistic i always try to avoid that one Ow. this is not a rule fellowship is not a rule the assembling together is not a rule getting together with people is not a rule but it's a heart thing it's a heart thing. We all, we need to do, all of us need to do all that we can to be with the body at every possible opportunity. And again, it's not, well, I've heard it said the church doors are open, so you should be there. That's not what I'm talking about. It's, it's being together with other believers because of your relationship and your salvation that has united you two together. Every possible opportunity. Work days are great fellowship. It's not at church. Coffee time where all of a sudden you're, you're talking about the Lord. There's been many, many, many game nights that we're supposed to be playing games that we don't play games because we end up talking about the Lord and fellowshipping around what he's done in our lives. And I like games. Every possible opportunity. God does things when we truly have fellowship. God does things through fellowship and by our fellowship. That's why it's important. That's why it made the list. That's why we should take it very seriously. Lord, thank you that you have put together things for us that we just can't even understand. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help our fellowship to increase. Help us to understand why and who we, th who we fellowship through. It's all because of you, Lord. We thank you for this time. Bless our conversation now. In your name, amen.